Oops. Okay, I think I'm recording. Here we go. Um, so before we get started, um, I just wanted to ask how many of you had heard of the ACRL framework before? And you can put in the chat or use the hand raise or however you want to do it. Let's see if Lois has. All right, and I'm also going to, by the way, um, put the link to my slides here in the chat because I do have a bunch of active links in here in case you want to go back and explore things later. Um, so I'm going to give you, here's our quick overview of what we're going to do today. I'm going to give an introduction. We're going to talk about this document, what it is, um, what it's all about. And then we're going to talk about some of the foundational ideas behind the framework. We're going to talk about how we might approach the framework and think about how it applies to us. And then we will wrap up with critiques and more. Um, and that will be mostly um, critiques and also some resources for implementation, um, which I think um, is an interesting conversation to have. Um, so I am a, a framework trainer for the AC, for ACRL. I'm on their pr presenter team for um, engaging with the ACRL framework. Um, but I, so I like to give that as sort of a, a caveat that I do work with this a lot, but I also, I always start those um, workshops and I'll also start with this one with that. This isn't really like a framework indoctrination workshop. It's really just something to explain what this is um, and how we might consider using it. Um, I don't think that the framework is a perfect document by any means, um, but I do think it's better than what we had before, in my personal opinion. Um, and I have spent a lot of time with it, both in my sort of daily work and in that role as a trainer. So to give you some introductions, um, here's some, some basics. So the full title, I will just call it the framework throughout this today, because the full title is a real mouthful. Um, it's the ACRL, Association of College and Research Libraries, Framework for Information Literacy in Higher Education. Um, it replaced another long name document, the Information Literacy Competency Standards for Higher Education. Those were passed in the year 2000. Um, they started revising the ACRL. Uh, they started with an idea of revising those standards and ultimately changed the format entirely to the framework. Um, and they started that, I want to say in 2013, um, and it was filed in 2015 and officially passed in 2016. Um, it defines information literacy in a different way than the standards did. The standards were, as you can maybe tell from the title, um, very skills-based. Um, so you would have these, um, they called them tasks and performance indicators. Um, so you could literally go through and use these standards as kind of a checklist. Students can do this, they can do this, check, check, check. Um, so they were very um, task and skill-based. Whereas the framework uh, looks at information literacy from kind of a different perspective. The definition that it uses is information literacy is the set of integrated abilities encompassing the reflective discovery of information, understanding of how information is produced and valued, and the use of information in creating new knowledge and participating ethically in communities of learning. So the standards, the ACRL Information Literacy Competency Standards, um, had approached information literacy primarily in looking at um, our students as consumers of information. So it was all about helping people figure out what they needed, helping people find that information, evaluate it, and then sort of use and, and ethically cite it. Um, which are all really important things, um, but they're not the whole of the information literacy landscape. And so this newer version really looked to see, okay, but how are we thinking of our students as also creators of information? They're not just consumers, they're also producers. Um, and how do they sort of work together to uh, engage in communities of learning? So there's a lot in the framework. It's a very aspirational document. Um, if you had a chance to skim it, um, there is a lot of, I think it has some pretty lofty goals, um, some of which I think are great goals and, and some of which I think are unattainable goals. Um, but just in terms of the why, um, they say the framework grows out of a belief that information literacy as an educational reform movement realize its potential only through a richer, more complex, 
set of core ideas. And then a bit later, and this is all in the introduction, framework offered here is called a framework intentionally because it is based on a cluster of interconnected core concepts with flexible options for implementation rather than a set of standards or learning outcomes or any prescriptive enumeration of skills. So that's kind of a sniping a little bit at the ACRL um, information literacy competency standards, which were very much a prescriptive enumeration of skills. So they're trying kind of defending or explaining their position here in the introduction to the framework about why why it was felt that a change was even needed. So one of the things that's also really interesting and different about the framework compared to the earlier standards is that it defines information literacy as a shared responsibility. Um, and that's something that is pretty different. The competencies um, and, or the standards for information literacy competencies um, really focused on the librarian being the sort of main person who can impart information literacy skills on a student using those sort of performance indicators in this, this skill-based teaching. The framework says we actually have to have this as a shared responsibility. It has to be infused throughout a higher education curriculum. Um, and we need, and they say librarians, I, I'm taking that to mean all like library employees. Um, so library employees, teaching faculty, institutional partners. And I also think, um, as it says a little bit later, students involve students themselves. So bringing students in actually as teaching and learning partners um, is sort of a new concept in the framework that we haven't seen before in a lot of our um, profession level discussions of information literacy. So this is one of the things that I think is really cool about it. The framework is developed so that we're supposed to be able to um, talk to our teaching faculty outside of the library about what this stuff is all about. It's supposed to resonate with them a little bit better um, than those more skills-based prior standards. So that's sort of the, the who, the what, the why. And now I wanna go into the actual foundation. So the, the framework itself is built on, I'm gonna talk about three main things. One is threshold concepts. Another is meta-literacy. And the third is backward design. So those are three things when you actually read the framework documentation, there's a whole section on how they developed it and why they developed it that way. And these are three really important concepts that come up there. So threshold concepts, this is really um, how, how the framework got started. The idea initially was that we would create a threshold concept document for information literacy. We would look at what the threshold concepts connected to information literacy would be, and we would go from there. Um, and this was coming out of a major interest in the scholarly literature, like on scholarship of teaching and learning about this idea of threshold concepts. So those are, according to, um, I like this definition from 2011 from Townsend, Brunetti, and Hofer, um, the core ideas and processes that define the ways of thinking and practicing for a discipline, but are so ingrained that they often go unspoken or unrecognized by practitioners. Um, so sometimes people talk about like expert blind spots and that sort of that's connected to the threshold concept idea. So this, this idea that there's sort of um, and I'll, I'll go from the, nef the next definition too, from Meyer and Land, who are actually the people who coined the term. Um, in the early 2000s, um, and an article they put together in 2005, um, they likened these threshold concepts to conceptual gateways or portals, thresholds, um, that lead to a previously inaccessible or an initially, an initially perhaps troublesome way of thinking. Um, so you can think about threshold concepts as like, you know, an actual threshold. You cross over this uh, gateway or portal or threshold um, and you have knowledge then that you didn't have before. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this with some examples, but this is um, a really popular idea um, among uh, teacher educators in a lot of ways. And also, um, again, connected to the scholarship of teaching and learning. There's an international threshold concepts conference every other year. Um, I went to it a couple years ago. It was pretty amazing. Um, these concepts are discussed a lot right now in health sciences education, um, in uh, some of the well, like sort of profession based like engineering, things like that. But it is gaining more widespread interest in like liberal arts disciplines. 
But up until this point, to my knowledge, there was no discussion of threshold concepts within information literacy. Um, and it, 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 it can be problematic because information literacy isn't a discipline. Um, and you can kind of see uh, in these definitions, they're very discipline based. You have to understand things a certain way to function in a discipline. The characteristics of threshold concepts that Meyer and Land identified are that they have to be transformative. Um, they have to be, it has to be something that's so big, some kind of idea that's so big that it completely transforms the way that you think. Um, they also have to be reversible. And this is actually where, again, that expert blind spot can be a problem because if you are an expert in the field, like you're a professor of economics or something, it's going to be hard for you to remember what it was like before you had that threshold knowledge um, because it was irreversible. You can't go back. Um, it's integrative. And I like the way they talk about integrative in this particular 2003 article that I have cited here. And I do have a reference list on the slides at the end. Um, in case you get really into this. Um, the, the idea of it being integrative is that it's sort of, um, they talk about it exposing connections that you wouldn't have been able to see before. So the threshold knowledge that you get when you sort of pass through a threshold concept, um, you can integrate that with uh, other things that you knew that you didn't realize were connected. The fourth concept is bound, or the fourth characteristic is bounded, and that's usually bounded by a discipline. Um, at the Threshold Concepts Conference a couple years ago, um, there was some conversation about this and that maybe this isn't really valid anymore. Um, maybe it doesn't have to be bounded by a discipline because we do so much interdisciplinary work, but it's still sort of part of the definition. And finally, it's got to be troublesome. It has to be something um, for it to truly be transformative, it has to be something that's not just like quick and easy to get. Um, so there has to be, you have to do a little bit of struggling with it. You have to kind of, um, I'm thinking, I know, I know Lois is in here, has had some, some teaching training. Sometimes I think about it like um, Vygotsky and the zone of proximal development. Like there's got to be a little struggle for you to be able to get to that next step. It has to be a little bit hard. It has to be a little troublesome. So when I learned about threshold concepts, I was like, this sounds cool, but I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, so I learn best from examples. Um, so here are a few examples. Most of these are from Meyer and Land. Um, so in mathematics, threshold concepts that are often identified are complex numbers and, uh, and limits in calculus. So these are things that I, you know, it's been a long time since I took calculus. Um, but I do remember having this sort of experience with the idea of limits. Like once I finally got it, it changed everything about the way I saw calculus. Um, in economics, an example that's used a lot is opportunity cost. Um, I wanted to pull in something from one of my liaison areas, women's gender and sexuality studies. There are actually quite a few uh, big threshold concepts in that area, in my opinion. But one big one is this idea that gender is socially constructed. Um, once you have crossed that threshold, it changes the way you see gender, it changes the way you see other categorizations and other binaries. In geography, map scale. Um, in political science, the, the concept of the state. Uh, and then in literary studies, this is a newer article um, where someone sort of proposes some threshold concepts in literary studies. And those are the idea of the text and a text being sort of anything you can analyze. Do you have context and idea of form? So these are some examples, but I'm curious with y'all from various academic backgrounds, um, can you think of any things that you might consider threshold concepts from your own educational experience? Most of my academic background is, is English literature. So I definitely think that idea um, of the text and, and knowing that a text is, um, can be in almost any form, that was an important threshold concept for me, now that I have the language for it. Sorry, I'm not seeing any examples coming up in chat. Yes, Darren Lee, you get it. Literature, we're here. Um, but if you think of any, I'd love, that's okay, Sam. 
I thought you might have some for film because I know your background is in film studies. Um, but uh, no worries on that. Um, but yeah, I think if you start to think about um, your education in different disciplines, another, another one like it, you can even think about it with sort of general education, liberal arts types of um, fields like history, the way that you might see history. Um, there are a lot of threshold concepts there. Lois says, for me, learning about different literary criticisms, new criticism, Marxist, feminist, et cetera, function this way. Yeah, and even the very idea that if you look at something through a different critical lens, you're experiencing it in a different way. I think even that itself is kind of a threshold concept. Um, so I think that if you, if you start reflecting on your own education, but there's also a lot of interesting examples um, that you can find out there online. Like I said, this is something that a lot of um, teaching faculty are engaging in. I don't know how much that's happening at UNCG necessarily, um, but all around the world, I've met people from all over the place when I went to that Threshold Concepts Conference. Um, and uh, I, was, I was really intrigued to see how they are how they were taking this idea and kind of running with it. All right, so that's threshold concepts. And again, the idea initially was that um, what ended up being the six frames of the framework would be six threshold concepts. It did not turn out that way, but that is sort of where they were going with this from the beginning. Another important concept is meta-literacy. Um, and meta literacy was defined by Mackie and Jacobson, and they're the ones who've really done the most work on it since they initially did it. That says 2001, but it actually should be 2011. I'm just going to fix that right now on the fly. Here I am. Uh, 2011 was when they coined this term, and this this kind of came out of the same thing that you saw when you looked at the informational literacy definition in the framework. Um, that the idea, the, the way we were defining information literacy was too limited. It was too focused on, um, you know, find, access, evaluate, and not on creating. Um, so I'm going to go to the next one here because I do have some, I have bolded the things that I think are really important about this concept of meta literacy. Um, it's all about critical thinking. It brings in the idea of collaboration in a way that earlier information literacy definitions did not. And it also brings in a lot of these other literacies. So digital literacy, media literacy, uh, primary source literacy, we can really think of it as bridging uh, or bringing together all of those sort of 21st century literacies, if, you, if you've heard that term. Um, it is, they say, a unified construct that supports the acquisition, production, and sharing of knowledge. So again, looking at that whole continuum from acquiring knowledge to producing knowledge to eventually sharing it. Um, and they talk specifically about some collaborative online communities. Um, but I like what they say at the very end of this quote here, standard definitions of information literacy are insufficient for the revolutionary social technologies currently prevalent online. And when you think about, um, I guess it didn't save, but when you think about what was happening in 2011 compared to what's happening now, I think we have even more social technologies than we had then. We have even more online engagement um, for better or for worse. So this concept was something that was really meant to extend the way that we were defining information literacy before this. And if you're a visual person, this is a model that Mackie and Jacobson put together. Um, so the meta literate learner is there in the middle. And one of the really important things um, to know about meta literacy is that it relies very heavily on metacognition. So metacognition, thinking about your own thinking, understanding how you learn. So there's a reflective element um, that comes with meta literacy that we didn't necessarily have in earlier definitions of information literacy. Um, and so in that circle that's kind of bounded by sort of, I guess, like an orange, we've got metacognitive in there. There are, there are cognitive um, elements of information literacy or meta literacy, which are the kind of things that we would probably already have identified with those sort of skills um, that we want people to learn. There are behaviors that we want people to practice. But another new one besides metacognition was this idea that there is an affective dimension. There's an emotional, there's, an emo there's a motivational, there's a dispositional sort of um, element to meta literacy um, that we have to take into account. And then around the outside, um, that bounded 
by the green circle there's all of the different roles that you might have if you're a meta literate learner participant a communicator a translator author teacher collaborator producer publisher researcher so does this expansion and extension of the way that we would understand um, what what it means to be an information literate person is what is what meta literacy was meant to do and the framework relies pretty heavily on that you end up seeing a lot of the metacognitive cognitive and affective um, stuff that that sort of orange circle there it also relies really heavily in terms of how it was created on uh, backward design, which is an instructional design concept that asks you to start at the end. What goals do you have? So what do you want people who are participating in your learning experience to know or feel or be able to do? Um, a lot of times it asks you to sort of come up with a list of knowledge, skills, and values. Um, and they rely specifically in the framework on the understanding by design backward design model from Wiggins and McTie. And that model has um, three stages. So again, it's starting at the end. What do I want my results to be? So they ask you, Wiggins and McTie, to identify desired results. What do you want to come out of it? And as part of that, two of the things that you identify in that stage one are enduring understandings, which are big core ideas, so big concepts um, that you would want your learners to come away with. And they won't always be like, so for, for me, um, a lot of the teaching that I do is, a, is one shot. So I teach a class, you know, I'm helping them prepare for a research assignment, it's 50 or 75 minutes and that's it. So enduring understandings are probably not going to necessarily happen in that time limited um, situation. But if I have an idea in mind of what those big conceptual and during understandings are that I'm working towards, it helps me to design even that very short learning experience. Um, and they also have, they also discuss essential questions and essential questions. Um, I really like, there's an example in, they have a whole book really that talks about essential questions, Wiggins and McTie. And one of the examples that helped me understand this concept was, a non-essential question might be, what were the causes of World War II? Whereas an essential question might be, is there such a thing as a just war? So these are like big, huge questions um, that can't be easily answered, that don't have one single answer. Um, and they're the kind of things that we might be thinking, all right, what are, what are we, what do we hope our students are working toward in these big enduring understandings or essential questions. In stage two, you determine your acceptable evidence. How will I know that the desired results were met? Um, and this is usually where you might design your, um, you know, your assessment and your other, other evidence that you might use. And then in stage three, this is for me the fun part, is where you plan learning experiences. Um, and Wiggins and McTie say that this three-step process is really important because it helps you avoid what they call the twin sins of instructional design, which I think is a little, a little dramatic. But those, those twin sins are one, coverage-oriented design, which is easy to fall into, where you just like, I have so much I want to tell you that I'm just going to kind of go at it, which is sort of what I'm doing today, unfortunately. Um, the other is uh, activity-oriented design. And I think of this as like, I learned about a cool activity at a conference and I want to use it in my class, no matter what my class is about. So thinking about the activity first and letting it be activity forward um, instead of having the activity kind of serve the desired results or the, or the learning outcomes. Um, and again, um, I will, before we're done, I'll paste the link to my slides again, because this uh, Vanderbilt, um, I think, I cannot remember what CFT, but it's kind of like their UTLC. Um, they have a really helpful um, page about implementing understanding by design. And we also have understanding by design as an ebook. Um, and it is, uh, to me, it has, um, I mean, I, I might even consider backward design kind of a threshold concept for me as a teacher, um, because once I learned about this idea of backward design, I, it, was, it was very transformative. So this is kind of always how I approach things, even if I'm not explicitly aware of it. Okay, so we talked about what the framework is, 
we talked about the three, three important concepts behind it. And now I'm going to go into actually approaching it. But before I do that, I want to see if anybody has any questions. And you can feel free to use the chat or unmute yourself. I'm also going to get some water because I'm doing that coverage oriented design right now and talking a lot. Okay, now move ahead. If you have questions, please feel free to put those in the chat. One of the things we talked about with the framework is this idea of shared responsibility. So it's not just on the library. It's not just on a teaching librarian or an information literacy librarian like me. I'm not responsible for the information literacy of every UNCG student. I'm, I'm partly responsible, faculty is responsible, the students themselves are responsible, and all of us, I think, in the libraries and across campus have some level of responsibility. So I wanted to go quickly through what the actual framework organization looks like. Um, so there's an introduction, and you've heard me quote from that. Um, there are six frames, and they did initially call them six threshold concepts, but there was such a backlash from people who were like, these are not threshold concepts that they changed it and thus a framework was born. So each of the six frames has a list of knowledge practices and dispositions underneath it, as well as a description of the frame. And those descriptions I actually think are, are very useful um, in figuring out what was actually meant by the creators when they put these together. There's also a lengthy appendix on implementing the framework. Um, and it had one of the things I think is kind of cool is there's a whole section just for teaching faculty like outside of the library and how they might use the framework and also a section for administrators about how to support the framework. Um, and then there is appendix two, I've mentioned this background on the development. They talk about the actual process of writing it, but also talk more about some of those foundational concepts and theories. And then there's a sources section. The frames themselves, the six frames, authorities constructed and contextual, information creation as a process, research, information has value, research is inquiry, scholarship is conversation, and searching is strategic exploration. And they say that they have these listed alphabetically, um, not in any kind of uh, importance order, um, that they're just supposed to be loosely connected. So it's not like you finish up with authorities constructed and contextual, and then you move into information creation as a process. Um, so I'm actually gonna go ahead and open up the framework. Um, in another tab, the ALA website wasn't working for me um, about two hours ago, and that gave me some, gave me a bit of a fright. Um, so I'm going to just look at one of these um, authorities constructed and contextual. Most teaching librarians that I talk to say this is their favorite one. I like this one a lot too, because um, it really does connect with a lot of what we do. Um, but so under authorities constructed in contextual, there is this bolded section. This is actually the part that I find my most useful when I'm thinking about implementing the framework or applying these frames. Um, so in this case, information resources reflect their creators expertise and credibility and are evaluated based on the information need and the context in which the information will be used. Authorities constructed in that various communities may recognize different types of authority. It's contextual and the information need may help to determine the level of authority required. Now in this unbolded section after that, um, they go into a little more detail, but one of the things that they do in this um, slightly more detailed description is they, they talk about the move from novice to expert for each frame. So a novice uh, information literacy learner might approach this frame in this way but experts understand things this other way. So they're kind of trying to get at this idea that there is again a continuum um, that's not from, it's not necessarily from novice to master, but from novice to expert. So when we start to think about what it means to be an expert in a particular area, um, they try to give us some examples here. The knowledge practices are actually pretty similar to student learning outcomes. So in some ways, these connect a little bit more back to the ACRL um, information literacy competency standards, but they do tend to um, be a bit more flexible than those standards were, and they're not as performance task driven. 
um, but they do get into like what what they would be a learner, learners who are developing their information literacy in this particular frame authority is constructed and contextual this is kind of what they're what they're learning or what they're hoping to learn or what they might be doing and then dispositions this is where we get a little bit into that affective and to a certain extent behavioral piece um, from meta literacy that sort of middle circle that we saw in the meta literacy diagram um, so example is develop and maintain an open mind when encountering varied and sometimes conflicting perspectives. That's not something we can really measure as a student learning outcome, but it is a disposition or we can think of it almost as a habit of mind that we're trying to encourage students to develop. So each of the frames is broken down in this way. Um, and to me, that's the best way to really understand each frame is to read through the like the bolded area and then the more in-depth introduction about novices and experts before jumping into the knowledge practices and the dispositions um, to me that makes it make a lot more sense i know the first time i ever read through this i was like oh that's a lot of text right here i'll just jump right to the knowledge practices um, and they're helpful i mean you don't necessarily need a huge amount of context for them but the context that you do get is very helpful and the context is where, um, you know, the, the folks that created this document, it was a very large committee, um, where they uh, are really explaining uh, their process and their purpose, and also sometimes explaining changes that they made because this was, a, was meant to be a pretty transparent and open process, and it was to an extent in that there was a lot of feedback and a lot of conversation, um, which ended up, you know, resulting in a bunch of changes in the document itself. All right, so back to my slides here. So I wanted to give you a couple of examples that I might use in a class session. Um, so one is actually a question I'm going to ask you, and this is something I do with students quite a bit um, when I talk to them about authority. So I'm going to ask y'all if you will use the chat and answer a question for me, which is, what's something your colleagues, family members, or other peers might consider you to be an authority on? What do people come to you for advice about? What's something that people know you know a lot about? So Sam says movies. I concur. Sam knows all the movies. TV shows. Sam's coming in hot with media. Thinking of things that I know about y'all, Terry says technology. I would probably also go to Terry if I had a ukulele related question. Um, I would probably get interesting British murder mystery recommendations from Lois. Um, TV book, which, which any format? More TV, okay, okay, nice. Um, MASH trivia for Terry, awesome. Uh, I know I might go to Darren Lee if I had questions about horror movies, which I won't because I'm too scared. Um, but if I had them, I might go direct to Darren Lee on those. Um, so we all have these things that people, people recognize our authority on. Um, and one of the examples that I often use when I'm talking to students about this um, is that in my group, um, in, in my sort of group of uh, folks I work with in um, ROI, people I work with a lot, so a lot of the teaching librarians, I read more comic books than most of those people do. So if they had a question about comic books, I might be the natural person that they would go to. And in that way, that's how my authority has been constructed because I have more experience reading comic books than they do. Um, but if I were to then be talking about comic books in my own home where uh, my husband used to manage a comic book store and has read way more comics than I ever have, then I'm not really the authority in that context. So that's an example where we can talk about um, you know, what, what it means for authority to be both constructed by the people you're with, but also different depending on context. Um, 
there's a video I use a lot in class that's from Oklahoma State University Libraries. Um, so they talk about like uh, the example in that video is is chili like you might be an amazing ch chili chef. Um, but if you were to enter a chili competition with professional chefs, um, your authority is probably not going to be at the same level as it would be if you were just like hanging out with your friends who can't necessarily cook. Um, or you might be someone that your friends go to for math help if you're a student, but you're not going to know as much as your math professor. So thinking about that context and how things change based on context, um, this was a really big shift in thinking about uh, authority and thinking about expertise. Um, because the way that is presented in the standards is more like, okay, we're looking for someone with a PhD um, and we're looking for these very specific markers of credibility, um, whereas authority is a lot more complex than that. And so the framework starts to get at that. Um, for the information creation as a process frame, one of the things I do is called a scholarly article autopsy. I did not create that name. I actually got this um, from Project Cora, which is a um, community online research assignments, um, and I adapted it. So, but one of the things that I ask students, this is CST 399, it is a research methods class for communication studies students, and they have to design their own research assignment. So one of the things I ask them when they are looking at a scholarly article is this final question here. Imagine that you're the authors of the article, briefly describe the process that you went through from idea to publication. And that gets students thinking about, okay, what's, you know, what comes first? Um, does the idea come first? Does the research come first? Then what happens? Um, because the, I always use peer reviewed articles. Um, so they get into this idea of when, when the peer review might happen. Um, so this is just sort of a scenario idea. Of course, I don't usually know exactly how an article came to, came to be. Um, but it gets students thinking about what that whole creation process is like. Um, and then scholarship is conversation. This is something um, that I have done a couple of different sort of citation tracking um, activities in class where students have to like follow a citation trail from one article to the next and see kind of how, um, how that creates a conversation. Um, and then think about how they might enter a conversation, how their research paper that they're writing is actually engaging them in that conversation as well. But now I want to ask y'all, so we've got two folks from Access Services, we've got me and Sam from ROI, we've got Terry from ARIT, um, we've got Darren Lee from Tech Services. Uh, so I want to ask you to take a minute to just think about and reflect on where you see yourself, where you see your work in this, in these frames. Um, so I'm gonna give you a minute or so, and then I'm gonna come back together. So I want you to be reflecting on where, where does my work fit just thinking about these frames? All right, so I see a few folks. Um, so for, for someone like me, my whole job is information literacy. So it's super easy for me to see connections with all these frames because I might teach all of them in my work. Darren Lee, information has value is definitely one I was thinking of with your work. Um, so information has value is an interesting one because um, a lot of times when we end up teaching it like in a library instruction class, um, we, we might approach it in thinking about citations, right? So um, citation is a way that you sort of attribute and give value to someone else's work. But we can't ignore that there is literal value in our information sources. So thinking about Darren Lee, your work with cereals, you know how much that stuff costs and it costs real legit money. Um, Thinking, Terry, yeah, research is inquiry, searching is strategic exploration. I definitely see both of those um, really working 
um, with the work that you do with ILS. Um, and thinking about the website, the website as kind of a discovery tool um, and an inquiry tool. So I came up with some, and Sam mentions all of them, but especially searching a strategic exploration um, and in terms of making online objects, information creation as a process. So I started brainstorming. You'll see I started to lose a little bit of steam towards the end here, but these first three, I was coming up with a lot. So in authorities constructed and contextual, I saw um, the work that SCUA does, helping students sort of analyze authors, thinking about creators and donors and putting them in context. Um, if you've ever seen, the, there's a really cool activity that they do with stuff, from, stuff related to the Greensboro sit-ins. Um, and it's a really good example of how um, you can think about authority and how it changes depending on your perspective. Um, the Society of American Archivists and the Rare Books and Manuscripts section of ACRL actually have their own guidelines for primary source literacy that are very closely connected to the framework, um, which I didn't go into today because I didn't see anybody from SCUA signed up. Um, but it is a cool connection and you can always look at those to see. Um, with tech services, I thought about authority control um, because it, in, we think about name authorities, it's a different kind of authority, but it is an important way that you're thinking about showing how a specific person with a specific name um, has developed authority on a topic. Um, and you can look and see sort of uh, using cataloging and metadata connections, you can see what they've done um, in work in that area. Information creation as a process. Um, I thought about a lot of different examples for this. I was thinking about in SCUA, looking at the different formats that they have, like scrapbooks and letters. Um, preservation services, this is kind of a, um, like a, a, a literal translation of information creation as a process, but like they actually create or recreate materials. In the DMC, there's such a focus on the creation of digital projects and thinking about, again, step by step, how does this work, how does this happen? Um, and then with digital projects, thinking about sort of David's unit, there's a lot of scanning, a lot of digitization that happens, which is another sort of important information access process. Information has value. I thought about interlibrary loan. Um, why don't we have everything? Why can't we have every book and every article? And a lot of that is because different, different concepts of value, right? Value, we have to make value judgments in terms of what we can buy but also there are these literal value concerns about how much stuff costs and that we don't have an unlimited budget or in the case of the past two years, we don't have a budget at all. Tech services, I see a lot of information has value there, like Darren Lee said, anything with acquisitions or subscriptions, but also the sort of recent focus on OER and even things like institutional repositories, um, making information accessible and free, but still high quality um, still very valuable, just not monetarily valuable for the person trying to access it. With research is inquiry, ROI and SCUA, I think we do this a lot. I think Terry's example was good too, of thinking about our uh, catalog and discovery system. It actually is, I think, organized in a way that is meant to um, promote inquiry. Um, scholarship, this, like I said, I was losing a little bit of steam here. Scholarship is conversation. Again, tech services, if we think about alt metrics, you know, metadata, cataloging. Um, in SCUA, I thought there are some things that are in literal actual conversation. Um, sometimes they have back and forth letters. Sometimes they have responses from people to someone else's. If you've been coming to the ULVLC letters from SCUA, uh, extravaganzas, which are a delight. Um, there are actual conversations going on. And access services, I think, could fit in a lot of these. But one way I was particularly thinking about access services is searching a strategic exploration. Um, so there's a lot of exploration that happens that access services facilitates. Just putting the books on the shelf is an important function of the strategic exploration. Um, the browse the shelf function that we have in the catalog, which also connects to Terry and Eric, um, and just like helping patrons do their searching and kind of figure out sometimes serendipitously where things are in the stacks and um, how things end up getting organized. 
But I think there's a lot more beyond these. I love the examples that y'all came up with. Um, and I think we could, we could brainstorm these for, for hours, but we won't, we won't do that. Um, I want to go through in the end here just some critiques of the framework. Um, there are a lot. I've just chosen a few. Um, a big one that uh, I hear a lot about and, and did, especially as it was being um, adopted by ACRL, was that people felt that there was really a lack of attention to this um, concept of critical information literacy. <laughs> yeah, Sam says it's perfect. It is not. I think we all know that. Um, I don't, I, I'm trying to think of a perfect document and I can't. Um, so there's not enough about critical information literacy. There's not enough about sort of um, critical theory or like resisting existing structures with information and there's opportunities for it there, but it kind of falls short. Um, and Balin also in the, in the same article indicates that um, it just doesn't really meet the goals that are stated for it. Um, it doesn't quite get there. Um, Mara Seal, this is a, an article I actually found really interesting. Um, she talks about the framework relying too much on just sort of accepted enlightenment ideals like democracy, freedom, um, neutrality even to a certain extent, that it doesn't do a lot to question those kind of things and why we have kind of accepted them as the way that we want to do libraries. Um, and she aligns it with a, a neoliberal political perspective and also looks at it in um, a post from a post-colonial perspective. Um, I didn't put that on the slide, but she talks about opportunities um, for applying some post-colonial pedagogy or uh, pedagogical techniques um, to the framework to make it better. Um, there's a cool article from Emily Drabinsky that uses the frames to critique the framework. So this idea that like, if authority is constructed and contextual, where, who, who's the authority here in the framework? Who put it together? How did we construct their authority in this context? How did it work? It gets very meta, but it's pretty short and interesting. Um, there are a bunch of concerns about elitism um, and sort of the language that's used often um, in the framework. Um, and then there was a lot of conversation during the creation of the framework about how it's not, they're not threshold concepts. Um, and they, they chilled out a little bit on this, um, I think in response to some of that, um, but they were very adamant about these six frames being threshold concepts initially um, until there was a lot of backlash indicating that they're really not, they're just, they're concepts, they're understandings, but they're not actual threshold concepts. There are also some great resources out there. I can also recommend more critiques of the framework, um, but I didn't want to end on too much of a bummer note. Um, so there are some great resources out there. Um, the ACRL framework sandbox is one that I really like. I'm going to just do a quick demo on this. Um, I'm going to go into the resources tab. Um, and this is, it's a mix of things. It's mostly like lesson plans and uh, activities, but there are also some blog posts and things like that. Um, yeah, Sam says this is one of her favorite ACRL resources. She only wishes there were more in there. Me too. But one of the things that you can do is you can say, like, so for me, um, one of the ones that I, I don't engage with as much as I would probably like is research as inquiry. So I might just limit to that frame and click apply and see what things are in here that have been identified related to that. Um, so I might take a look at Research's Inquiry for Senior Seminar Class in International Relations. Um, and it looks like this is a handout I shared with students in a senior seminar class, talked to them about Research's Inquiry, showed them different things they could do, um, and then did some research consultations. And these always include things like lesson plans or activities that are downloadable and available. Um, so you can kind of go in and see um, how people have taught these kind of things. Um, I find that really useful because I get a lot of inspiration from other librarians and other instructors. Um, but it also helps me as I'm thinking about the actual frames themselves and how I might be able to talk about them. 
All right, there are two other ones on here. Um, there's the framework toolkit, which is separate, but it is through ACRL and it actually has a lot of um, sort of, I'm having issues with libguides again, this happened to me earlier. Um, it talks about dealing with some of the issues that you might have, like finding time to actually engage or thinking about, there we go, um, thinking about uh, strategies to use, um, what kind of questions you might want to ask, and then also gives in here um, not as much as the sandbox, but it gives you some discussion prompts and activities and things like that that you might be able to use. Um, and then this is another one. There are uh, quite a few sort of, uh, I guess, Palmy is like a consortium in Pennsylvania, um, but they have their own sort of uh, guide with this that I actually think is really cool. Um, and they talk about different learning objectives, they have activities, they share videos. Um, so it's kind of similar to the sandbox in, except that it is not something that's like you search or navigate to a specific area. And they really go into a bit more depth about how they approach the framework in their own work. So that's it. That was a lot. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments? Please feel free to unmute yourself if you do or put it in the chat. All right. Thanks, Lois. I'm glad it was a great overview. Um, one of the things that I would really like to do is um, have more conversations with people in other departments in the library to think about um, like how we can, like kind of like we started brainstorming today, right? How does this connect with our work? How are we part of this? Because I think in, um, in libraries, this has really just gotten sort of like, it's like, oh, it's just an information literacy thing, which of course it is, it's in the title, um, but it is also more than that, right? I think it's something that connects to our services and our resources. So the last thing I'm going to do is just put that um, link to the slides in here again. I think I got it right. But if you do have questions or you want to talk about the framework or how um, how you might, you know, be into thinking about it in your own work, I would love to chat with you. But I want to thank you all so much for coming. And I hope everyone has an awesome rest of your Wednesday.